In the 1950s, a medical breakthrough promised to help many. Marketed as a safe drug that promised restful, high-quality sleep, it quickly became a household name. But what began as a revolution in modern medicine soon unraveled into a global tragedy. Thousands of babies were born with severe birth defects and numerous families were torn apart. This is the story of one of the most devastating medical disasters of all time. This is the story of thalidomide and the Contragan scandal. Medication is defined as, quote, a drug or other form of medicine that is used to treat or prevent disease. Medication should help us, but what if medicine does more harm than good and destroys the lives of numerous innocent people? 1954, Stolberg, Germany. Heinrich Mückter is finishing a report. Mückter was recently appointed head of research at the Grünenthal Pharmaceutical Company, where his team began experimenting with heating peptides in an attempt to create new antibiotics. One day, they heated a molecule called phthalolysoglutamine and created a molecule called thalidomide. This molecule was not antibiotic, but it seemed to have sedative properties. When the research team gave thalidomide to mice, they became relaxed and slept long hours. More astonishingly, they discovered that animals could tolerate high doses of thalidomide without showing serious side effects or becoming dependents. And this turned thalidomide into a gold mine. While other sedatives were already on the market, they often came with severe side effects and you could overdose on them. Grunenthal began mass producing thalidomide under the brand name Contragan, promoting it as a safe alternative to existing sleep medication. Christmas Day 1956. A man anxiously waits as his wife goes into labor. But when the baby is born, they made a shocking discovery. The child had no ears. This man was an employee at Grunenthal, the very company that had developed Contragan. He had given the drug to his pregnant wife believing it would help her sleep more soundly. This foreshadowed what was to come. October 1957. Over the past months, Grunenthal's worked towards gaining approval for selling thalidomide. Now it was freely available in German pharmacies without prescription. In the years following its release, thalidomide was approved and marketed in over 40 countries, including the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, Sweden, Japan, Mexico, and South Africa. Thalidomide quickly gained popularity and became an instant success. More than 300 million tablets have been sold in the first year. In 1961, thalidomide had captured 46% of the market for barbiturate-free sleeping pills. Thalidomide was marketed as a wonder drug that could treat all kinds of symptoms, including insomnia, flu, cold, or morning sickness. Thalidomide was regarded as a safe alternative to other sleep medication where you can overdose. Because of this perceived safety, pregnant women, who are typically very cautious when it comes into taking the medication, became a key target audience. Advertisements were produced that claimed that thalidomide was, quote, completely non-poisonous, astonishingly safe, fully harmless, completely safe for pregnant women and nursing mothers without any adverse effects on mother and child. Little did anyone know that the side effects of thalidomide during pregnancy weren't really tested. 1958. A series of mysterious health diseases shattered Germany. Increasing numbers of reports emerged of children born with severe malformations, while others never made it to birth. It became clear that something was terribly wrong, and people quickly found a culprit. Atomic bomb testings. You see, the Cold War ramped up in the 1950s, and atomic bomb tests steadily increased. By that time, it was already well established that radiation can damage the human body and cause cancer. So could this be the reason for the sudden rise in birth defects? Pediatrician Karl Beck thought so. In May 1958, he released an article where he laid out his theory. Quote, Whenever atomic bombs were detonated, embryos in the area near the Franconian clinic were damaged shortly afterward, leading to the birth of deformed children seven to eight months later. This article sent shockwaves through German society. On the 14th of May 1958, the German Bundestag assembled to discuss Beck's hypothesis. They wanted to answer two questions. One, is there an increase in birth defects in children? Two, if yes, is radiation responsible? The Bundestag ordered state ministries to probe information about birth defects in Germany. They wrote to hospitals across the country. A few months later, they had the report. There is no evidence for an increase in birth defects over the last years. Politicians were totally fine with that, but not everyone shared the sentiment. Physician Franz Büchner criticized the report. He prophesied that, quote, the questions of the frequency of malformations and the origins of malformations will not rest. And they had a very good reason to criticize the presented data. You see, at that time, it was really difficult to track birth defects in West Germany. Only some years ago, the Third Reich used mandatory statistical monitoring to commit crimes. So Western Germany had been very reluctant in doing such monitoring. 
and clinics often didn't have any documentation on birth defects. 1960, Düsseldorf, Germany. Neurologist Rolf Voss writes a letter to Grunenthal. He has observed that some of his patients suffer damages to the central nervous system after taking in thalidomide. And he wasn't alone. In the following months, Mückner, the scientist at Grunenthal, received more and more warnings. But he seemed to have brushed them off. He once told a British distributor, quote, they'd heard of occasional reactions, allergies most likely, but they vanished after the patient stopped taking a pill. It would take over 19 months from the first warning before thalidomide was finally withdrawn from the market. 1961, the United States. Dr. Francis Kelsey was one of three reviewers that should admit thalidomide to the US market. It was seen as an easy approval as there are hardly any issues with sleeping medication, but Kelsey felt that something was wrong. When she reviewed the case studies, she found the evidence supporting the absence of side effects to be unconvincing. Then she found an article from some weeks ago that linked thalidomide to damages in the bone marrow of four patients in Scotland. She wrote the manufacturers and inquired about this study, but they claimed they haven't heard about this. Kelsey wasn't convinced and she inquired additional data to find out whether thalidomide can cause nerve damage. However, the other side was unwilling to conduct further studies as they felt it would take too much time. So this conversation would go back and forth and thalidomide would never be approved in the US. Later in 1961, Germany. Physician Widukind Lenz is writing up a medical report. Over the past months, he had observed a sharp rise in the number of infants born with birth defects at his clinic. More than 50 cases in total. When he talked to the parents, he discovered that the mothers had taken thalidomide during the pregnancies. What Lenz didn't know was that another physician has made the same discovery on the other side of the planet. An Australian doctor, William McBride, writes to the Lancet Medical Journal after noticing an increase in the number of birth defects in babies born at his hospital. Also here, all the mothers had taken thalidomide during pregnancy. Both reports were released and shocked the world. The media rapidly amplified the story and panic soon ensued. Doctors around the world now focused on reproducing the findings and they all made the same discovery. Taking in thalidomide during pregnancy is strongly linked to birth defects. Countless infants are born missing their ears, limbs or parts of their internal organs. After the link became undeniable, thalidomide was pulled from the markets. How could a drug that seemed so safe cause such devastating harm? The answer lies within chemistry. Thalidomide is a so-called chiral compound. In the case of thalidomide, two mirror images of the molecule exist due to the carbon atom that connects its two ring systems in the middle. A chiral compound is a molecule that cannot be superimposed on its mirror image, much like your left and right hands. Even though your hands look similar, you can't perfectly line them up. Your thumbs will always point in the opposite direction. In the case of thalidomide, the molecule exists in two versions called the R and the S version. While the R version of thalidomide is a safe compound, the S form is responsible for causing birth defects. Using certain chemical reactions and purifications, you can create either version of thalidomide. However, they are converted back and forth in the human body. When the S form of thalidomide enters a cell, it binds to a protein called cerebellum and inhibits its normal activity. When thalidomide disrupts the system, it causes dysregulation of critical developmental genes, most notably vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF. VEGF plays a key role in the formation of new blood vessels. Thalidomide blocks VEGF production, which leads to reduced or absent blood vessels. Without adequate blood supply, cells in rapidly developing tissues start to deteriorate and we get birth defects. It may sound a bit complicated, so here's a short summary. The S form of thalidomide binds to cerebellum and disrupts the regulation of key developmental genes, including VEGF. This then prevents the proper formation of blood vessels and leads to birth defects. And only one single tablet containing 50 mg of thalidomide is enough to cause lasting birth defects. How could scientists miss such dramatic side effects before thalidomide was released? Well, for one, it's difficult to spot. Scientists repeated the same animal studies the scientists from Grunenthal have conducted and they also found no evidence of birth defects in mice or rats. It wasn't until much later that scientists have observed harmful effects in other animals and in this case it was a very specific strain of rabbits called the White New Zealand rabbit. And this is just not a standard model to test medications. Moreover, the rigorous clinical trial standards we have today were not common practice back then, which helps to explain how this was not discovered. However, several months passed between first reports of side effects and withdrawal from the market, a delay that paved the way for legal proceedings. In 1968, the trial began in West Germany, charging nine Grunenthal officials with negligent homicide and injury. 
It became one of the most important trials of modern Germany. Thousands of affected parents and their children were hoping for justice. The bill of indictment they prepared ran over 972 pages. In support, they had lined up over 351 witnesses, 29 technical experts, and 70,000 pages of evidence. The defense, on the other hand, hired over 40 of the best attorneys. Countless witnesses testified and endured long cross-examinations. And then, the trial was shut down. A settlement was reached between the prosecution and the defendants. No formal verdict was pronounced against the defendants. What happened? There are multiple explanations, and they often depend on who you ask. One is that the trial became legally and logistically overwhelming. A settlement was seen as a pragmatic way to provide compensation without dragging the process out further. Others argue that a verdict could have settled a legal precedent for liability in pharmaceutical cases, possibly opening the door for further claims. And then there were rumors of political interference. According to an article by The Guardian, there was immense pressure to settle a case outside of courts. The defendants and the lawyers allegedly met in secret with the Federal Health Ministry to discuss the trial. Moreover, Joseph Neuberger, one of the defendants' lawyers, resigned from his position only to become Minister of Justice for North Rhine-Westphalia, the state where the trials were held. According to the same article, he allegedly, quote, wrote to the prosecutors to demand they stop proceedings against his client. I would be personally obliged for rapid execution. However, it is important to note that the same article has been criticized for ordering dates, misinterpreting documents, and even falsification, which means that the claim of political interference is not substantiated. Whatever the reason, a settlement was reached in 1970. As part of a settlement, Grünenthal paid 100 million D mark into a special foundation, and the West German government added 320 million D mark. The foundation paid victims a one-time sum of 2,500 to 25,000 D mark or 1,250 to 12,500 US dollar and a monthly stipend of 100 to 450 D mark or 50 to 225 US dollar. However, many criticized these efforts as inadequate given the scale of the harm caused. By 2008, a coordinated effort called the International Contragent Thalidomide Alliance successfully pushed a global review of compensation, demanding justice from both Germany and Grunenthal, along with updated support packages for survivors. Their advocacy led to reforms in 2013, which raised maximum monthly pensions from 612 to 6,912 euros which is 673 to 7603 US dollars. Over the years, Grunenthal has issued several apologies and contributed an additional 50 million euros to the Kondogan Foundation in 2008. You might now assume that after all of this, thalidomide was taken off the shelves for good. Well, this story doesn't end here. 1964, Israel. Dr. Jacob Shaskin was presented with a 44 years old patient who suffered from erythema nodosum leprosum or ENL an inflammatory complication of leprosy. The patient had fever, severe muscle and joint pain, and a skin eruption that made him unable to sleep. So the doctor prescribed him thalidomide, and he was astonished to see that the patient made a quick recovery. His symptoms vanished after three days. He summarized his findings, and thalidomide became a worldwide used drug in leprosy patients that developed ENL. Scientists began to hypothesize that maybe we can use the toxic properties of thalidomide for therapeutics. They reason that if thalidomide is so effective in destroying cells, maybe we can use it to destroy diseased cells. In 1997, Dr. Bart Belogi treated 39 patients with relapsed and refractory multiple myeloma with thalidomide. Surprisingly, thalidomide was remarkably effective in treating these patients, most of whom had no other treatment options. In a subsequent clinical trial, 32% of the 84 patients treated responded to therapy. Based on these findings, thalidomide was approved by the FDA for the treatment of ENL and multiple myeloma. Today, the administration of thalidomide is strictly regulated by the thalidomide risk evaluation and mitigation strategy. But unfortunately, there are still some cases of thalidomide-derived birth defects today. Especially in poor communities, the use of thalidomide has led to an increase in birth defects in the last years. For example, in Brazil alone, there are over 100 reported cases of thalidomide-derived birth defects. In these cases, the mothers are often suffering from leprosy and ENL, and they require thalidomide. And that is the story of thalidomide. In the 1950s, a medical breakthrough promised to help many. A pill that was meant to offer a safer way to sleep and treat everyday ailments became one of the most devastating medical disasters in history. The thalidomide scandal is a story of shattered lives and the fight for justice. But it's also a warning, a reminder of the importance of rigorous drug testing and strong medical regulation. Let's hope that something like this never happens again. Well, that was a sad topic. 
What is your opinion on the Contagun scandal and what should I cover next? Let me know in the comment section. And with that, I'll see ya. If you're interested in a science scandal that shook stem cell research in Japan or want to learn about the worst surgeon in modern history, check out these videos.